Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to uh, everybody joining the webinar. Thank you for your time. Hopefully that uh, everybody is uh, seeing my screen and the presentation. Uh, Brad, please uh, interrupt me if, uh, if that's not the case. So uh, thanks for the introduction again. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, cellulose-based materials and how we can characterize them using uh, inverse gas chromatography. So for the, some of those familiar with SMS technology, uh, some of these uh, slides in the beginning will be uh, review, but I do like to set the stage of uh, where uh, SMS instruments uh, play a role in your physical characterization toolbox uh, and where it uh, lies with other uh, analytical and uh, physical characterization uh, techniques. So I often classify uh, characterization, solid characterization techniques where you use um, either energy as a probe. This could be lights or x-rays or lasers, um, looking at light in, light out, energy in, energy out, to look at structural and or analytical information like x-ray diffraction, IR, Raman, um, optical microscopy, those type of techniques. You can also use heat as a probe, looking at heat gain, heat loss, heat transfer. Um, these are your calorimetric techniques like DSC, uh, TGA, um, TAM, those type of things. And in general, you're looking at thermodynamic information. Where surface measurement systems uh, lies in this space of where we use molecules as a probe. So here, uh, we're looking at, um, in particular to SMS technology, we're going to look at how a vapor molecule um, might interact with a sample that could be via adsorption, where it just interacts with the surface, or it could be uh, via absorption, where it dissolves or partially swells or interacts with the bulk uh, of the sample. In particular, related to, um, to natural materials, these are often considered uh, polymers, you will get uh, both surface and bulk interaction uh, with the various vapors. So we're looking at how these molecules may interact with the material so we'll introduce them to the material and then see how they uh, come out or they may not come out of the material. But we're looking at this adsorption, desorption phenomena, and we can vary the molecule, vary the temperature, vary the conditions, um, and um, vary the uh, chemical nature and or size of these molecules. And um, that can determine different uh, both structural uh, and or physical chemical properties uh, of the material that we're looking at. In particular to today's presentation, um, we're going to use a technique called inverse gas chromatography. SMS has been involved in inverse gas chromatography for, uh, for over 20 years. Um, it's uh, not a technique that we invented, but it's a technique that uh, we have uh, pioneered and championed over the last 20 years. It's based on the principle of a material, uh, it's typically in a column, it doesn't need to be, but we do a pulse injection of a particular vapor and we measure how long it takes that vapor to travel across uh, the column of the material and it's this retention time um, that we're measuring. This retention time is a function of the flow rate, the temperature, uh, the concentration, the molecular species, uh, and the sample that we're investigating. And depending on how, what variable uh, you adjust, we can learn things, both surface and bulk properties uh, of the material under investigation. So these things can be things like surface energy, surface area, solubility parameters, diffusion coefficients, heat absorption, uh, and so on. So as I mentioned, uh, inverse gas chromatography is not a technique that SMS uh, invented. It's been around for quite some time. Um, and just to give a, a sense of history and the trajectory of uh, inverse gas chromatography, uh, I have a histogram essentially of uh, publications that reference uh, inverse gas chromatography according to Google Scholar going back uh, to the mid 1970s. And you can see uh, even as, er, as uh, late as uh, 2019, uh, the trend is uh, increasing 
uh, references to publications using inverse gas chromatography. So currently there's between about 500 and 600 publications a year using inverse gas chromatography for a wide range of applications, materials, uh, and industry sectors. The most commonly measured property uh, that we see um, and what the bulk of the literature that you will find is looking at it to measure the surface energy. Uh, the surface energy of a solid is analogous to the surface tension of a liquid. Surface energy is uh, often defined and used as gamma term. So like gamma L is the surface tension of a liquid. Gamma S is the surface energy of a solid. And it's very often divided into a dispersive or nonpolar contribution and an acid base or polar contribution, depending on uh, different literature resources. Um, uh, this is also called gamma LW for London van der Waals, Lifshitz interactions. This again is some, sometimes called gamma polar. Uh, but we typically use the more widely accepted is that the total uh, is a combination of the dispersive component of the surface energy and the acid base component of the surface energy. Essentially, to get these um, values, you have to use some nonpolar or dispersive molecules in inverse GC. Uh, to get the dispersive component, and you use some Lewis electron acceptor electron donor molecules to get the acid base contribution. Uh, I'm not going to go over that today. Uh, if you have specific questions, please message us. We can give you all the background and the theory and things like that. So, why do people care about surface energy, and what does it affect in terms of material properties? Um, this is a slide I've, I've shown in, in, in other presentations, but uh, I do like to uh, just review it, uh, just for those not familiar with surface energy and, and what it may or may not affect. So if I have a uh, surface like this uh, rectangle here, and if I increase the surface energy of that material, I will increase the wettability uh, of that surface. If I have a powder and if all other properties are unchanged, and all I'm doing is increasing the surface energy of the particles, I will increase the cohesive forces and it will increase the cohesion or uh, reduce a powder flow. It'll um, agglomerate, it'll stick. Um, that's just due to the interfacial uh, attraction of these particles. Very often in various uh, steps of industrial processing, I may have some sort of milling or grinding or some sort of uh, mechanical uh, thermal uh, stress uh, to, the, to the surface. And very often this will open up defect sites, create amorphous material, create some sort of surface disorder. In addition to making the surface rough, it very often will increase the surface energy of the material because um, these kink sites or other defect sites have fewest nearest neighbors, so therefore has an excess surface energy energy compared to a clean, ideal crystal surface. And finally, in a formulation type of application, if I have, let's say, two particles, a large particle and a small particle, just to show for illustration, and if I increase the surface energy of the larger particles, I can overcome the cohesive forces of the smaller particles, uh, and then I can increase interfacial adhesion. This doesn't have to be particles. This could be uh, fibers with a polymer matrix. It could be uh, two surfaces. It could be any two surfaces. Uh, although there are many factors that affect ultimate composite adhesion, um, the surface chemistry and surface energy is something that we can measure, monitor, track, and uh, quantify how that can be. So we can also uh, change the surface energy uh, via surface modification. Uh, some materials, you might have a low surface energy material, and by doing various, uh, let's say, chemical treatment or mechanical treatment, uh, you can increase the surface energy to make it higher. Uh, on the flip side, I may have a high surface energy sample, and by passivating the surface, waxing or coating or silanizing, I can decrease the surface energy. So surface energy is not a, uh, whether it's high or low, does not correlate to good or bad. It depends on the process, it depends on the sample, it depends on the formulation. Um, so for some materials and some applications, uh, let's say for powder flow, I may want a low surface energy. 
if I'm trying to coat a surface, I may want a high surface energy, so therefore it'll actually coat or wet uh, a certain uh, a certain other material. So the uh, idea is that by measuring and quantifying uh, any of these surface energy changes, we can see how these changes in surface energy may affect uh, uh, formulation uh, and or processing conditions uh, throughout the uh, material life cycle. So one thing that's unique to inverse gas chromatography is we have the ability to get not only a single value for surface energy, but a surface energy heterogeneity. Most real surfaces are energetically heterogeneous, which means they're not defined by a single value. Much like in a powder, a single particle size does not define every single particle. There's a distribution of particle sizes. Most real surfaces have a distribution of surface energy sites. So what the um, inverse gas chromatography technique allows us to do is to get a distribution of surface energy sites uh, by covering various amounts of the monolayer. And this is all done uh, if we know the surface area of the material, which I'll talk in more detail about later, and we know the molecular size of the probes, we can inject a discrete amount of vapor to cover X, Y, Z amount of the surface. And then that allows us to build up a heterogeneity profile for the surface energy of the material. And I'll show that with a, um, once I know the surface energy, um, then I can look at works of adhesion uh, and works of cohesion. Um, and that's defined by a thermodynamic work of adhesion where I have between two dissimilar surfaces um, or a work of cohesion, which is between two similar surfaces. So then I can compare, will a material stick to itself or will it like to stick to another surface if I know the surface energies of those two surfaces? So getting back to uh, surface energy heterogeneity, this is uh, a study that's surface measurement systems done a, a while ago. And if you've seen any of our webinars or been to any of our on-site seminars, you've probably seen uh, this slide before, but um, it is a very good example of how we can uh, change only one variable of a, of a product of a material, uh, namely the surface treatment or surface chemistry. And uh, we can use inverse gas chromatography to see how those surfaces are different. So this slide is showing the surface energy uh, dispersive surface energy on the uh, y-axis and the fractional coverage on the x-axis. So this means we're covering more and more of the surface. So the surface energy values we get uh, are dominated by high energy sites at low coverages, and then we get more of an average value at high coverages. And the material we're looking at is a mannitol uh, crystalline powder. So the crystalline mannitol as received is in red. It shows that it is energetically heterogeneous, which means it has a distribution of surface sites. And those are due to the different crystal planes. Each crystal plane will have a unique surface chemistry. And that is uh, observed by this uh, heterogeneity in the surface energy. And we can get a maximum and a minimum and an average surface energy by integrating uh, this curve here. And we have a silenized mannitol means the exact same material, same particle size, uh, same particle shape, uh, same surface area. Nothing else was done other than coating the material with uh, basically we're methylating the surface uh, through a silenization process. And we can take a powder that is energetically uh, heterogeneous to energetically homogeneous, and we can passivate the surface and make it lower in surface energy. This is the dispersive component. And here is the specific or acid-base component. And we see a similar trend. We go from an energetically heterogeneous surface to an energetically uh, lower energy and homogeneous uh, surface. So how can this actually affect um, some actual bulk property or behavior of the powder? So as I mentioned in the uh, a few slides ago, is that we can use the surface energy to calculate a work of adhesion or a work of cohesion. So the work of cohesion is the likelihood of that particle to stick to itself. So if we look at the as received mannitol, it has a higher surface energy. So therefore we'll have a higher work of cohesion. 
and compared to that to the silanized mannitol, which was lower surface energy, a lower work of cohesion. So therefore, from a thermodynamic standpoint, the as-received mannitol will be more likely to stick or agglomerate or uh, reduce powder flow, whereas the blue or silanized mannitol will flow better. And one way to get an uh, actual measure on flow properties is by using uh, a Freeman FT4 powder rheometer. Um, and this is an impeller that is turned through a bed of that powder um, and it's being aerosolized by an air stream from below. And if we look at the energy required to turn this impeller uh, through a bed of the as-received mannitol, we can see from here, the as-received would be predicted to um, not flow as well. And we see that here, is that uh, it requires more force to uh, turn this impeller because it's inhibiting powder flow compared to the silanized mannitol. On the x-axis is the air velocity that is used to uh, aerosolize this bed. If you go to high enough air velocities, you can overcome those cohesive forces and the surfaces will look similar. So it's uh, number one, showing surface chemistry does have a large effect on uh, adhesion and cohesion. Secondary, there are other factors that can go into play. And if we put enough air into the bed, we can overcome those uh, thermodynamic uh, surface interfacial uh, uh, forces, and now the powders can, can flow uh, if we add some other energy in to overcome the cohesive surface energy. So that's just one uh, simple application. Um, and in the short webinar, that's all I was going to go over. Um, I wanted to um, give a couple other examples of how this could be applied to some cellulosic um, natural materials. And this is a study that was um, uh, done in particular by uh, NIST. Uh, this was published back in 2014, where um, we wanted to look at the um, uh, source of various nanocelluloses. Those familiar with nanocellulose know that you can create nanocellulose through a range of processes. So this is looking at basically um, uh, a chemical way, a mechanical way, and, and, uh, and basically through enzymes or bacteria. So a range of cellulose sources were uh, used, how they were uh, defined, and then um, this was a larger paper where multiple um, uh, techniques were used to characterize these nanocelluloses. Inverse gas chromatography was one of them, and it's a little bit busy slide, but the bottom line is you can see from these various types of nanocellulose, they have unique dispersive and acid-base surface energy profiles. So although these are quote-unquote nanocellulose, the surface properties of these nanocellulose are vastly different depending on how we create them. And just to um, show the importance and the growing uh, trend in nanocellulose is that this paper was published in 2014. And uh, as of um, uh, today, uh, there is uh, 272 citations of this paper. So this was only part of a, a larger study where uh, there was a much larger characterization of these nanocelluloses. And if you want to, here's the reference for this, uh, for this paper. Another example of uh, looking at uh, different cellulosic materials and how surface energy is one way we can characterize those. This was a, a, a study not done by us, but done uh, by uh, Dr. Doug Gardner at the University of Maine. And again, it's a larger study, and I just wanted to show some examples here. Um, is that um, this is the dispersive component of the surface energy of various uh, cellulose materials um, at different temperatures. So we can see uh, some certain trends that as you go up in temperature, you see a decrease in the surface energy. And you can also see that these different sources of or treatments of cellulose uh, can vastly affect the surface energy of these materials. So there was a correlation between hydroxyl number and dispersive surface energy. The higher the hydroxyl number, the higher the dispersive surface energy. Also, the surface energy, as I mentioned, decreased with increasing temperature, 
and that was related to agglomeration of particles. So I'm going to, I'm already taking a little bit more time than I thought. So I'm going to quickly uh, move on to surface energy is one thing we can measure by inverse gas chromatography. Another commonly uh, measured property is surface area. That can be challenging uh, for natural materials with traditional techniques. So traditional techniques use uh, nitrogen uh, at 77 Kelvin uh, to measure the nitrogen absorption and then subsequent surface area of these materials. Um, however, you can use any molecule as long as it forms the right isotherm and you know the cross-sectional area of that molecule. So for instance, you can use octane, butane, water even. Uh, it's not typically recommended for natural materials, but uh, krypton, argon, anything that will form the right shape isotherm, you can measure a BET surface area. Um, the most widely used uh, molecule is nitrogen. Um, however, when you get below one meter squared per gram, uh, the reproducibility uh, becomes challenging and it's recommended to go to krypton, uh, but krypton is extremely expensive and not a lot of people uh, like to use it due to the exorbitant costs of, uh, of krypton compared to nitrogen. So there's also um, the uh, requirement to go to vacuum conditions and liquid nitrogen temperatures uh, for to measure the surface area by nitrogen techniques. Um, for natural materials, this can cause a problem. Um, they might have different amounts of water content. When I rapidly uh, dry them uh, under vacuum and uh, nitrogen, liquid nitrogen conditions, I can change the structure of these materials. They might collapse, they might uh, go through a phase change, they might change the material. So uh, for instance, uh, this is a paper uh, from Advanced Powder Technology a few years ago. Um, and the bottom line is that the, um, the surface areas were not uh, able to measure them with nitrogen. So krypton could be em uh, employed, um, but they still had the problem of going to very low temperatures. So inverse gas chromatography was used at ambient temperature um, to risk altering the crystal form. And to highlight that, um, I'm going to show a quick study that was done um, with uh, uh, surface measurement systems in the Imperial College of London and the University of Vienna using various techniques to measure the surface area of cellulose materials. So a volumetric nitrogen absorption, inverse gas chromatography, and dynamic vapor absorption. All three of these methods were used. Uh, these are the experimental conditions. Obviously, nitrogen was done at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Uh, DVS and IGC were done at 25 degrees C using octane as the molecule to measure the isotherms. And various uh, cellulose-based uh, materials were used. I'll show data on one of them. Um, this is part of a larger study that I won't go through today. But again, I do want to reference Imperial College London and University of Vienna for their help with this work. And Dr. Uh, Annette Condor from Surface Measurement Systems for uh, doing the bulk of the work uh, for SMS side of things. So one of the challenges in a nitrogen system is getting uh, fluffy cellulosic powders into a BET tube, um, and you had to use about 15 milligrams of sample. In uh, inverse gas chromatography and, and or DVS, it was a lot easier. In DVS, if anyone knows our DVS products, we just put about uh, three milligrams of sample into a sample pan. In inverse gas chromatography, very easy to place a few milligrams in a tube, unlike the volumetric technique, you don't have to get it all the way down to the bottom of the tube. You can just place it uh, within a few centimeters and it's quite easy to get it into the uh, inverse gas chromatography system. So we measured the isotherms uh, using octane. These are the right shape. They're a type two isotherm. We go out far enough into the relative partial pressure range and you can see that they are quite reproducible. This is IGC isotherms on the uh, nanocellulose of the freeze-dried cellulose. This is the nitrogen absorptions by the BET instrument. And here are the DVS isotherms um, measured using octane. Again, very reproducible. Although the isotherms are reproducible, we can see that the resulting BET surface areas are quite different. So by uh, inverse gas chromatography in DVS, we can see that the surface areas at 25 degrees C were around 65, uh, 68, 
uh, meter squared per gram. However, um, you can see here for the nitrogen absorption, the surface areas are much lower and they change if they've been run multiple times. So the first time they were run around 31 meters squared per gram, that goes down to around 20 meters squared per gram, whereas subsequent measurements are all uh, relatively constant uh, by the atmospheric-based uh, techniques. So we looked a little bit further at this, and uh, we just looked at running the same sample uh, after several different outgassing runs. And you can see that um, for uh, inverse gas chromatography, very consistent, whereas the nitrogen data we saw every time you ran the sample, uh, the values changed. And so there could be a couple reasons for this. Um, we can see here uh, with inverse gas chromatography, even if we vary the flow rate, vary the conditions, we get uh, the same results um, uh, within about one meter squared uh, per gram. So the advantages of the inverse gas chromatography is that um, we can degas it in situ, good reproducibility, quick experiment. Um, the volumetric technique for these type of materials, um, the biggest issue is the low temperatures and vacuum conditions can alter the structure and the state of the material, um, which uh, clearly shows a difference in surface uh, area compared to atmospheric-based techniques like inverse GC uh, and or DBS. Um, one other thing, and I will wrap up here, and I apologize, I'm going a little long, um, is that not only can we measure these at atmospheric temperature, we can measure surface area values as a function of relative humidity. So we can see at real world conditions, how does that affect the surface area of these materials? Um, this is showing data at zero, 50, and 90% RH. This is showing on an avicel and microcrystalline cellulose, the surface area. It's around one meter squared per gram. We get to about 65% relative humidity and we see a dramatic decrease in the surface area. Most likely water could be uh, causing a phase change. And now I see a structural change uh, in the material as I go to higher humidities. So um, as, I, as I wrap up, um, this uh, short webinar hopefully highlighted uh, some uh, applications looking at both surface energy and surface area for inverse gas chromatography and cellulosic based materials. I want to thank uh, the uh, colleagues uh, at SMS, uh, at NIST, uh, Imperial College, and also uh, Imperial, uh, um, um, the University of Vienna and um, ICL, and for your time and attention. And I'll leave my slide on um, here to look at our upcoming webinars, and I'll pause and uh, Brad, or if there's anybody else that could direct me to any questions or anything else, uh, I can help at this moment. Okay, during this time, uh, we're going to take a brief moment to answer any questions that you may have. So you may unmute yourself and ask the question, or feel free to type uh, your question in the chat bar, and I will be sure to get that question answered. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask us. <clears throat> um, hi, Dan. Can you share the title of the paper from Imperial College measuring the surface area of nanocellulose? Um, this was a presentation that was done at the American Chemical Society uh, last year in 2019. I'm not sure. I think it's in press. I will find out if we have, a, if we have the uh, final paper for that. I believe it's in, in press right now or in publication, so it might not be uh, released as of yet, but I, we can, uh, I don't have it at the moment. Sorry about that. Um, they said thank you. Yeah, we can How share the, um, sorry, we can share the full presentation uh, that was done at the ACS, American Chemical Society meeting last year. Um, if you message us on that, we can share that with you. How do you differentiate between surface and bulk interactions of vapor and materials in IGC? That's a good question. And that's one of the reasons why we um, um, did this particular study here is that um, in inverse gas chromatography, you typically ass assume that you're at fast equilibrium um, and you're looking at surface properties. Um, and one of the ways we can confirm that is by varying the flow rate. If we get the same answers, the, the, the same retention time, the same uh, uh, retention behavior, um, 
under uh, varying flow rates, then we know we're dominated by surface interactions. If we want to study um, bulk interactions, we would go to a temperature range, uh, a concentration range, and a flow regime where we're going to encourage uh, bulk or dissolution behavior. Overall, inverse gas chromatography is mostly used for surface properties, um, but you can do experiments where you vary the flow rates and look at diffusion properties into the bulk, and then we get outside of this linear range and we go, it's a, called a Van Diemter analysis, where we can go to lower flow rates and higher concentrations to um, be in the bulk uh, range for, for investigation. How do you... Um, go ahead. Go ahead. How, how, do you, how do you explain the difference in surface area measured by BT and IGC? Sure. What we believe is happening is that the conditions um, that were used in the nitrogen data, so for instance, the cryogenic temperatures and the uh, vacuum conditions are changing the structure of the material. So this is not uh, only this phenomena. It is known that if I drastically dry out some materials, um, for, cause water to leave very quickly, I can crash the structure of the material. So what we believe is that by going to these extreme conditions, extreme for these materials, if it's if it was a, a quartz or if it was a, a rock, that's not going to matter. But for fragile organic materials like a freeze-dried cellulose or a nanocellulose or some um, pharmaceutical materials, uh, a shock to the material collapses the structure, and that's why you see a, a decrease in surface area. Um, and, and that is uh, known for other materials as well. Would we expect a similar difference for micronized materials? Um, if they are uh, by micronized, it, it shouldn't it, it, it shouldn't matter. I mean, it depends. If it's highly crystalline, we may not see this uh, behavior. Um, if there's a lot of void spaces, um, and it all depends on the material. If that thermal and or pressure shock is going to cause uh, some sort of structural change. Um, the micronizing is looking at smaller particles. Um, you would typically, as these particles get smaller, you see an increase in surface area uh, for sure. Um, but this phenomena is more structurally related, not just uh, material related. Thank you. Yeah. Um, someone had a, a question of a humid sample doesn't affect the system as the system is in gas phase. Um, Yes. So what we do is when we uh, introduce humidity to the, to the instrument, uh, we've actually humidified the carrier gas. So you can use nitrogen and or helium as a carrier gas. So the carrier gas is fully humidified to 10%, 80%, 50% relative humidity. We allow it to reach equilibrium with the sample. We flow it over there for a period of time. So humidity remains constant. And we use an FID detector, which does not detect water. So it's not affecting the signal at all. And then we can inject the other molecules on top of that humid carrier gas and then measure the retention behavior um, with or without moisture present. So it does not affect the uh, functionality or the mechanism of how the instrument works. It only will affect if humidity is changing the sample, uh, will it affect uh, the end result is because not due to uh, just the, the system, but due to moisture is actually causing a change in the sample. Do the dispersive and acid-based surface energies determined by IGC match the values determined by the contact angle measurements on flat surfaces? It seems the dispersive energies that you showed for a nanocellulose seem very high in relative to acid-based energy, yet this material seems to have a significant level of OH, which I would have thought would contribute to a high acid-based energy. Sure, very good question. Um, and the answer is, um, it's related to, um, so yes, on flat surfaces, um, it's related to the energetic heterogeneity. So a contact angle puts a droplet of liquid and measures an average surface energy. So if I was to compare inverse gas chromatography data directly to contact angle data, I'd have to compare the values at high surface coverages. So um, in particular to this study here, this was done on powders. Um, we, not we, um, the, the uh, particle engineering group at London Imperial College 
grew macroscopic crystals that were two, three inches in, di in dimension and measured contact angle on the individual crystal planes. And those contact angle uh, values matched directly with the inverse gas chromatography values on the powders. So I will get good agreement, but I do have to go out to high coverages. And that's part of the advantage of inverse gas chromatography is that real materials are energetically heterogeneous and I can actually measure and quantify that heterogeneity. Whereas by contact angle, I'll get an average value. Um, but I would have to compare the values by inverse GC at what we call finite dilution or high concentration. At infinite dilution, yes, you're 100% right. You will typically get higher values than contact angle. How do you surface area results compare between DBS and IGC with octane? We can go down to here and we can see, uh, like I said, I just uh, highlighted some things, but if we look right here, sorry, um, let me just go through a few slides. Right here, so this green is IGC with octane, this blue is DBS with octane, and you can see we get exactly uh, the same results. So within the error margins or the, the measurement conditions, uh, we get the same answers by DBS and IGC using octane for both techniques. Um, then uh, I think this is a response to a previous question. Yes, using N2 absorption, we must degas materials, but I do not think it can change the structure. Rather, evaporations of some absorbed gases on the surface or Add Rob? Well, uh, well just, to, just to be clear, for all of these techniques, we do have to outgas the sample. And if we uh, go back to here, um, just to, uh, for this study, all three, um, I think it's here, all three techniques, we outgassed them at 120 degrees C for 24 hours um, to remove the surface sorbates. The only difference is that, so we heated them up to 120, for DBS and IGC, we measure them at 25 degrees C. Um, for uh, nitrogen absorption, you measure them at 77 Kelvin or minus 196 uh, uh, degrees C. So um, I agree, all samples will outgas. Um, however, it is known that cryogenic temperatures and vacuum conditions can cause some fragile materials to change structure. Um, not for what I would say rigid inorganic materials, uh, like maybe a zeolite or an activated carbon or other things like that, but it can happen for some fragile um, organic materials. And that's what this is highlighting, is that this is one of those uh, uh, applications. What type of analysis is better for hydrated materials, IGC or DBS? Where can I find more info about these techniques? Well, obviously, you can uh, find some information on our website, and we'd be happy to, to help you out if there's something specific. But um, there's not a one-size-fits-all for hydrated materials or for hydrophilic materials. Inverse GC is typically um, more sensitive to subtle surface chemistry changes. So if I'm looking at um, maybe um, a small amount of impurity, if I'm looking at uh, if I micronize or mill or do something to the surface, am I going to have a more subtle um, uh, change? And the reason for that is an inverse GC typically works at low concentrations and in, at in infinite dilution. I can very often look at very subtle differences, whereas DBS is more of a bulk technique. I'm looking at the entire material um, through the vapor absorption. Um, so if I want to look at very subtle surface chemistry changes, inverse GC might be better. If I want to characterize the overall hydrophilicity or structure of the material, a DBS is considered what I would say is a bulk technique where IGC is more surface sensitive. So there's not a one size fits all, but uh, both are complementary. Um, is it advantageous to study surface area at different humidities? It depends on the material. Um, it's not something that's typically done. It depends on if it's a uh, your material is going to be processed at different humidities or if the material goes through a phase change. If it's a rigid uh, inorganic material, you probably wouldn't gain much from it because you're just, the moisture isn't going to change the material. If my material is moisture sensitive, is amorphous, um, it, water acts as a strong plasticizer, then it could have some value. 
Can we measure the surface area of highly porous materials like activated carbons at uh, greater than uh, 2000 uh, M2G? Uh, uh, not by inverse gas chromatography. That is a limitation. So inverse gas chromatography, because of the nature, or at least uh, uh, most people in a, in a pulse technique, um, it is hard to measure very high surface areas. Um, for those materials, I'd recommend something like dynamic vapor absorption, which can easily do uh, very high surface area materials like activated carbons, like MOFs or zeolites or things like that. Uh, in a pulse mode, typically we focus below 100 meters squared, maybe 200 meters squared per gram uh, in, I, in, in IGC. So it does have limitations. Um, in the, the data that I showed here, the way we ran the experiments, it'd be difficult to measure surface areas above 200 uh, meters squared per gram. Octane is a relatively large molecule. I guess it's good for me, the porous materials. We try to test other compounds. Yeah, we have done other compounds, and, and, and you're right. Um, if I go uh, here, I believe if we look, um, here is the, so nitrogen is uh, around uh, 16.2 squared uh, uh, angstroms. Octane is uh, about four times the size of that. You could use water. I wouldn't recommend water for uh, an organic material, but for inorganic materials, you certainly could use water. It's even smaller um, than uh, nitrogen. So, but you are right. Um, we only can get access to the surface that we can, but even for a microporous material, octane would get into a microporous, which is below 20 angstroms, um, uh, but it could, be occluded to some things. Although we could use that to our advantage. We could look at size selectivity um, and we can use molecules with different cross-sectional areas to look at size selectivity of microporous materials. All right, um, there's two more questions and then we're going to wrap up. Um, okay. Is it possible to use a polar probe molecules like, like acetic acid? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, ethyl acetate, acetic acid, I don't know if we would directly use acetic acid. It depends what we would say is polar, but um, you can use, uh, if you're talking about surface area, you can use any molecule as long as it forms what's called a type 2 uh, isotherm or a type 4 isotherm where it forms a monolayer and then grows layer by layer. Um, in For surface energy, you can use any molecule you want if I want to look at the acid base uh, contributions to surface energy. For surface area, the criteria is it has to form a type 2 or a type 4 isotherm. So that's that's uh, material dependent. Okay. And final question, uh, can you please say where Annex A is from? Oh, sorry. That was from the larger study. Um, yes, that's where this, uh, this uh, is here. And it is just, it's actually taken um, from the... Um, uh, there's a certified reference materials, and there's been a cross, uh, cross multi-lab, multi-functionality, multi-instrument study uh, by the European uh, Commission uh, where this was taken from. So it's taken from, if I look at, um, if I was to, to look up um, a, a BCR, uh, um, there's some uh, uh, surface area uh, studies uh, that were done on multiple samples, um, on multiple labs with multiple techniques to uh, determine that that's where this uh, this uh, table is taken from. Okay, well, I wanna thank everyone for joining this webinar today. Uh, we hope you found this webinar very informative and very helpful. Um, if you have any further questions, you're, please feel free to visit the website at www.surfacemeasurementsystems.com or feel free to email us at science at surfacemeasurementsystems.com. Um, and we'll answer all your questions if you have any questions in the future. Again, that, that wraps everything up. And uh, thank you, Dan, for the uh, presentation and for uh, the webinar today. And it was very informative. And we hope everyone has a great uh, rest of your day. All right. All right. Thank Take you. Care. Stay safe. All right. Bye-bye.